A watershed is the land area that drains into a particular stream or river. And the streams running along the bottom of a watershed inevitably are affected by what goes on in the rest of the basin, both good and bad. Although these waterways make up only 1% of the watershed, they are a critical component to watershed health. A well-functioning stream contributes to water quantity and quality, and it plays an important role in flood and erosion control. And of course, it's where the wildlife and fish live. Well, each species of, of salmonid that uses this system uh, has a different freshwater life history. Steve Johnson has spent years studying salmon and trout in western Oregon. Here's a, here's a coho salmon. Uh, emerged uh, a little over a year ago out of the gravels. Has spent all uh, last summer and, uh, and all this last winter rearing in the watershed and now he's finally, uh, finally heading out. On Ten Mile Creek, a half dozen species of fish use different parts of the stream system during different times of the year. The, uh, many of the other species in here, the juvenile coho, the, the, the steelhead, the sea-run cutthroat trout, are spending at least one winter, and w in case of the trout, usually multiple years, uh, in this system before they actually uh, go on their seaward migration. The, the longer these fish have to maintain their population in the fresh water, uh, the, the more tied in they are to the, to the structure. Uh, the structure Steve's talking about, the fallen trees and boulders, the beaver ponds, and the meanders all slow the water down. The result, quiet pools and a refuge from floodwaters and predators. A safe haven for young salmon and trout. Slowing down the water allows gravel to drop out and form gravel beds where fish spawn. And insects, a food source for growing fish, thrive. Slowing water down also helps control down-cutting erosion and improves water quality by causing fine sediments to drop out. These days, many streams are missing critical structure. Historically, trees and snags were removed to clear the way for boats and for logs en route to sawmills downstream. Beginning in the 1950s, in an effort to reduce the negative impacts of impassable man-made logging debris jams, often all wood, both logging debris and naturally occurring wood, was removed. When the practice ended in the 1970s, many streams were left barren of woody structure. In-stream restoration can be as varied as the watersheds where it occurs. At one extreme, a whole watershed restoration can include changing tree plantations into natural forests, removing roads and culverts, planting riparian areas. On Ten Mile Creek, where Steve Johnson's working, ridgetop to ridgetop restoration is underway. The U.S. Forest Service is jump-starting the in-stream restoration process by harvesting some big trees and using helicopters to place them in the creek. The man-made structures are placeholders, maintain stream function. This move buys time for trees to grow and rocks to roll. It may take a hundred years or more for natural delivery of materials into this stream. The project has attracted a lot of attention. Jack Sleeper is in charge of the project for the U.S. Forest Service. So our philosophy was pretty much give the stream the materials it needs to make fish habitat. and Hopefully that will last us until our vegetation grows up and can start functioning naturally. This is an expensive way, you can't afford it. We can't afford to do this kind of restoration everywhere. You need to maintain your repairing area. Often land use makes basin-wide restoration impossible. Oh, come on girls. Come Bob on, Drummond girls. is a cattle rancher in Western yeah, Oregon yeah, along girls. Buck come Creek. On. And when I bought this place and when I moved over here, I saw it as pretty well used up. Practically uh, every tree of value was uh, taken off the place. It was hot here. I mean, uh, there were no big trees down in the bottom land. 
Erosion was Bob's big concern. He contacted fisheries biologist Tony Stein for help. Tony suggested planting trees and shrubs. I did that, but at the same time, Tony uh, went a lot further than that, rather than just uh, addressing the immediate erosion problem at that site. He talked about the reasons for uh, the erosion and uh, then uh, talked about how they were uh, building in-stream uh, structures to slow down the uh, flow of water. He explained to me how the creek had, uh, had uh, over years, had uh, channeled itself down onto the uh, bedrock, was uh, flowing faster. Uh, for different reasons, uh, it had been, the creek was straightened. Um, anyway, the result was a faster uh, stream. Anyway, Tony uh, asked if I was interested in, uh, you know, doing more than just uh, something right at the site where the erosion was, but going all the way back upstream and placing these structures in with the hope of uh, slowing the uh, flow. Here we're looking at a pool that's a result of uh, placing this structure here. I think we could find uh, gravel has been uh, kicked up over the structure and uh, placed just forward of it. As you can see from Bob's work, adding structure, the logs and rocks, slows the flow and gravel drops out. As more and more gravel falls, a gravel spawning bed forms. Good news for returning salmon. A stream's condition is affected by land use and land use priorities. That's true on both the west and the east sides of Oregon. These areas were settled in the late 1800s, early 1900s. Uh, when the first settlers came in, they brought in large numbers of livestock, predominantly cattle, and they grazed the riparian areas very heavy. But today, some landowners like Jim Bowersfeld, a rancher and veterinarian, are making improvements along Mill Creek in eastern Oregon. He's been at it the last 10 years, and his neighbors are taking notice. The first year um, we started this project, we fenced the creek and kept the cattle out. And so, because the cattle actually do a lot more damage um, to the new willow shoots and the new alder shoots and anything else, um, you know, the cattle were fenced out. Um, we had some structures in that raised the water table, and the willows and alders started growing. And um, now, in many areas along the creek, it's a jungle. They're very, very thick, and we've had a couple high water events where neighbors that have had, um, you know, lush green pasture going down to the edge of the creek and no woody debris to hold the creek, the, uh, the high water events washed those pastures away as compared to this section of the creek where we have lots of woody debris holding um, the stream edges. Um, they came up and saw that we um, didn't have uh, as much um, so-called damage, and so they're all interested in, in um, doing the same thing. Landscape and land use dictate the fix. The Bowersfeld Ranch is a good example of making improvements that are good for the watershed, the red band trout, and good for business. Turning these streams to historic, pristine conditions is really not a viable option. Uh, these landowners need to make a living off of this land and having these creeks meander back and forth across these va uh, broad valleys like they did historically is, is not a, a reasonable option. So really what we're trying to, to do here is a compromise. Brett and the ranchers he works with are allowing vegetation along the streams to grow, reducing stream temperature and slowing stream flow when water is high. Other ways used to slow water down are recreating bends in channelized or ditch streams, a meandering effect, and by adding structure, logs and boulders. Large rocks and boulders are only used in streams where they naturally occur. Using backhoes and heavy equipment, Brett's team is just mimicking the work of nature's contractors, the beavers. The, the beavers are actually pretty phenomenal. Uh, beavers are, are wonderful for the creek. It's incredible what they do. Once vegetation is reestablished, beavers move in. They build dams that store water, raising the water table, a benefit to fish and streamside plants during the dry season. 
The dams also slow high water during storms and provide a refuge for fish and wildlife. On the west side, beavers are just as busy doing the same things. Don Wagner is a forester for Whole Oaks Lumber. This is the kind of natural area that, that everybody's trying to create today with dollars. But this is an area here that, that didn't cost anybody anything. It, uh, done anything it's, it's just been left up to mother nature and the beavers and the beavers have come in and made these dams in here and and we left everything alone and it's, it's created a great habitat for just about any critter that wants to use the area in including the salmon that are coming up the stream in fact research shows that beaver ponds are an important resource for rearing salmon and trout in Oregon this low-tech passive restoration started when Hull Oaks replaced a culvert with a bridge. We had beaver problems in here. They continually plugged our culverts up, and so we, we uh, did a cost share with the state. Uh, we put this bridge in uh, two winters ago. Uh, the beavers now have free reign of the territory, and we don't have any problems with them. And we also now have uh, clear fish passage, so it's a win-win for all of us. Plugged culverts is one concern for forest landowners. Losing some trees is another. We occasionally lose a, an alder tree like this right here. We might even lose a, a fir tree like this right here. But they're going to be with inside the, the buffer strip of the stream and, and we're not allowed to, because of the Forest Practices Act, uh, use those trees anyway. So instead of us using them, the beavers are using them. Like Hall Oaks, Starker Forest is concerned about culverts and fish migration. Traditionally, culverts were designed to efficiently move water with little consideration for fish and sediment passage. Also, the other problem, as you can see, is this perched outlet. It's about a one foot drop from the outlet to the pool in the stream, and juvenile fish cannot pass, they cannot make this jump and swim through the pipe. So the new Jennifer Noonan is a forest engineer for Starker. During the low flow of summer months, when the impacts to fish are minimal, Jennifer and her crew replace the small culverts with bigger ones that are embedded in the stream. The result, fish can move upstream and wood and gravel can move downstream. In a single season or two, the stream bed can change dramatically. At one time, this stream had all bedrock below the culvert crossing, and now that we've replaced the culvert, the stream material, the sediment, and cobbles have been able to flow through the pipe and fill in the bedrock below the, below the culvert, uh, allowing good habitat for uh, salmon. Whether it's changing culverts in the country or in the city, or a basin-wide restoration on forest land. In-stream restoration is at best a stopgap that buys time, while nature regenerates the elements needed for watershed recovery.